Hello and welcome. How's it going, everybody? Happy Tuesday. Welcome to another episode of The Healing Home. I'm your host, Michelle. And, you know, today it is episode 26. So just kind of, uh, you know, taking stock of the fact that for 26 weeks I've been working on this project and this podcast, and it's been such a fun journey. And I've been learning so much and I've been appreci appreciating so many things in so many different ways. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's been tuning in and supporting and, um, you know, just being a, a, a driving force for me to actually keep going because it really does help to know that people are appreciating what I'm putting out there. They're appreciating the guests that are coming through. A lot of people are in the, everybody comes through in the chat. It's so amazing to see and hear your insights because there's always so many really great nuggets and uh, informative things that you guys share as well. So it's all very important to me. And it's all also really important to my guest today, who is Mario Garza. And many of you already know who he is, the uh, creator, the, um, uh, just the artist and the man behind Symbolic Studies. And so I'm honored, as always, to have him along my journey and next to me um, in life, but as well tonight, because we are going to get into the grace of Venus. And he came up with this title. And when he told me the title, I was like, oh, man, that's awesome. So I love the title of the thumbnail. I love the subject. Both of us really have a lot to say about it. I know Mario has been preparing a really great presentation for us. Um, and together, we're going to weave our thoughts and um, our insights on this topic together. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to be fun. We're both very excited and uh, happy to share it with you guys. So before we uh, bring Mario in, just want to say again, thank you to all my patrons, all the people that have been um, signing up for Patreon lately. It's just I say it every time, but it's very much appreciated. Mario and I appreciate it so much. And it is really, uh, it's it's keeping it's keeping me motivated to continue to uh, put out this content and share with you guys. So um, yeah, thank you to everybody. Uh, Patreon.com slash The Healing Home. If you want to become a patron, we're happy to have you. So without further ado, I want everybody to help me welcoming Mario to the stream. What's hello, up, hello. babe? How's it going? Hi. Not much. It's going great. I'm really excited about the topic today. And, you know, we've been putting this together over the last couple of days, few days. We've been thinking about it. And it's really, man, it, it's powerful stuff. And so I feel like every single sign that we cross through, it just, you know, it affords you new opportunities um, symbolically with things to decode and break down and, you know, consider and all that kind of stuff. And I'll just say that Venus and some of these symbolic threads related to Venus and Taurus have just come through really strongly. And so, you know, I, I've had a fondness for, you know, Taurus for years now, to be honest. But um, I think it's kind of Venus's time this year for me just to kind of understand a new wrinkle to uh, everything she's related to. So I'm happy to get into it with you, of all people, with you, of course. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, you know, we've been talking about this stuff for a long time now, but I do. I feel like this year, for some reason, Venus came through and is coming through really strongly. And I mean, we talked about this, too, on Vibrant on the Taurus episode that we did in the beginning of the month and how all of us were feeling that same way. All of us were super excited for the episode, feeling the abundance and the, just the excitement of this time of year. And so, yeah, I mean, it kind of is bleeding over into the presentation we're going to give today because I know you have a lot of new insights that you've been coming across and you've just been having a lot of epiphany um lately within the last few weeks i know and specifically with venus and a few of the things that are related to uh, what we're going to talk about today so um yeah i'm excited for you to share what you've put together and um and then uh, weave our stuff together it'll be awesome definitely definitely and you know i just thought of something right now i think this is what we should do so i have my taurus print behind me right there and uh, we should give away a print this episode Ooh. I Maybe like that. to someone who just um, makes a comment on the video and, um, you know, not in the chat, but, um, you know, an actual comment underneath the video. And uh, maybe just within the next 24 hours or something, we'll pick someone and then we'll just give it away. 
Yeah. What do you think I love that, that idea. Okay, I think that's cool. a good one. Yeah. Nice. So maybe after I give my stuff, my presentation, uh, I'll show people the poster and see what's going on. <laughs> and we can kind of check in with people and reiterate the fact that we'll be doing this. Okay. That sounds good. Cool, cool. And uh, I love that generosity that you're always thinking of that, of, you know, sharing the love of uh, of art. So it's really cool. And um, before we start to um, just let everybody know where they can find you, even though a lot of people watching might even already know. But um, for people who don't aren't familiar with you, just uh, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me at SymbolicStudies.com. That is uh, where you'll find all my social media links and everything else. I consider YouTube to be a pretty big hub for me now. So at Symbolic Studies, I have a lot of videos and live streams and things like that that people can check out if they're interested. Um, and I would say Instagram too is is a bit of a hub for me as well. Symbolic.studies. You are muted. That mute button. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, that, no, that's great. And, uh, did you mention Twitter? Because you should mention Twitter as well. You're also on there. I know. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Symbol studies is, uh, my handle on Twitter. So I'm in a few other places, but I would say YouTube, Instagram, uh, and my website are probably the main places that you should check out. Nice. And, uh, before I pull up our presentation, I just have to say, I brought everybody flowers today. Oh, so I brought, nice. I brought everybody some lilacs. Uh, we are lucky to have an abundance of lilacs on our property and they are just in full effect right now. Um, they smell so amazing. We have multiple lilac bushes. Um, and I just in the, in the, um, energy of Venus too. Cause, uh, I mm. always really, I think of my mother when I, uh, smell and see lilacs because they're always one of her favorite flowers, if not her favorite of all time. And so I think it's interesting too, that they bloom during this time and they have a very lovely, soft feminine energy to them. And so, um, yeah, just wanted to say brought everybody some flowers and some lilacs. Um, if there was smell vision on these computers, um, <laughs> I'd say take a <laughs> whiff, but, uh, yeah. One so, day. Yeah, I'm sure it's coming if it's not already, uh, uh, you know, already On happening anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Alrighty. So let's uh, pull up this presentation here. And cool. yes. Yeah, so let me take off this. Okay, cool. Yeah, right on. Awesome. Man, I mean, every single planet really uh, volumes can be written about every planet, right? Every single symbol, same sort of thing. There is a classic saying, it's something like, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a symbol is worth a thousand pictures. And so um, every planet you can really unpack for a very, very long time. And um, Venus is obviously no different. And so these are some of my first initial insights regarding the symbolism of Venus, what I'm picking up, what I'm finding to be really important right now. And um, we'll just get into it, um, you know, as we go through the slides and everything else. But I obviously want to hear your opinion about a lot of these things. You already know what the slides are going to be. But I think you have some really good insights about Venus and the Venusian energy um, just in general. And the fact, obviously, that you're a woman. You know, when we were talking about this presentation, it's really funny that I was getting really esoteric and kind of diving deep into some of the occult aspects of Venus. But then at a certain point, we kind of stepped back too and realized that, hey, you know, the Venusian energy can be seen all around you. You know, the fact that um, women are natural nurturers and providers and um, embrace, you know, those around them um, and have the ability basically to love and be loved. So, right, so this uh, projection and reception sort of thing, I think, is related to Venus in so many different ways. So, um, you know, I think of the divine feminine and fertility and beauty and uh, all of those different types of things. So there truly is just a whole wide spectrum of information that we can get into. But to begin things off, I want to talk about the actual glyph of Venus. So moving on to the next slide, we will see that Venus, it's a very simple glyph, yet there is so much to unpack just from this in and of itself, right? And so 
it is a circle with a cross underneath. And one of the things I've been saying about it is that what this really represents is the feminine over the masculine. So the priority between the two halves of this symbol, there is this feminine circular sort of shape, obviously, and then there's the cross. And so it's really classic to associate circular, spherical, curvy shapes with the feminine for obvious reasons, you know. So a lot of people interpret the heavens as being more spherical or being more circular, whereas Earth uh, oftentimes is related to the square or the cross. Um, but yet there's something very feminine about the Earth as well, right? Mother Earth, as an example. But if you're going to find a symbol that is predominantly related to the feminine, you know, the circle is is that symbol, I would say, in so many different ways, right? Because it really represents, um, at the end of the day, totality and, and union, you know, it's very holistic. And then we're going to later on in the presentation be getting into the mathematics, too, that are related to the feminine and how that relates to spirals and curves and things like that. So just the mathematics behind the circle, you know, there's this infinite sort of quality um, with it. So that is a deeply feminine symbol, the circle. So it also represents the womb. And so it's the terrestrial womb. It's uh, the womb of literally mother. But then it's also the cosmic womb as well. Right. So as above, so below. There's this whole entire idea. You could even look at it as just like a vessel, you know, in general. Um, so you have this feminine glyph because the circle is up top, the cross is down below. And when you flip it, this has been used as a symbol for Mars. And so the old saying is men are from Mars, women are from Venus, right? So when you flip it upside down, you're actually putting the cross above the circle. And so you're kind of implying that the feminine is in a, um, is in a lower state, or that the feminine isn't as high up in the hierarchy as that cross, as that more masculine cross, I would say. And so, um, so this glyph is really interesting because when you're looking at things Kabbalistically and you're looking at the Kabbalistic tree of life, there's 10 sephiroth. And you'll see the Kabbalistic tree of life all over the place. But as an example in the Rider weight deck, you know... Um, the high priestess or the priestess she has the kabbalistic tree of life right behind her and the 10 sephiroth are actually composed or made up of pomegranates which is a really really interesting fruit for so many different reasons but it turns out it's really interesting if you want to skip to the next slide that the glyph for venus is actually the only glyph that really fits within the tree of life covering all of the sephiroth so here you see the 10 sephiroth of the tree of life, and you can see that Venus, the glyph itself, actually fits snugly within all of them, and all of them are contained, you know, within this whole entire setup. This is really fascinating. I learned this a few years ago. And um, one of the other very, very intriguing things that I'm, like, totally geeking out on right now is the idea that in the middle of the circle is the hidden Sephiroth, which is Doth, D-A-A-T-H. And so Doth, this Sephiroth, is how you get to the other side. And so I'm actually going to be doing a show tomorrow with Juan from uh, the Juan on Juan podcast, and we're going to be getting into all of this information. But I just find it really fascinating that the hidden Sephiroth would be in the middle of this circle. It is associated with the north as well, Doth is. And this is the gateway to go to the other side um, using certain Kabbalistic traditions, essentially. And so the other side, you know, to a lot of these people is basically strongly, deeply feminine. And so within the feminine, the most feminine portion of this glyph, within the center of it, you have this hidden Sephiroth, which is also deeply, deeply feminine. So to me as I was putting this presentation together and thinking about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, the hidden Sephiroth is like right there, you know, right in the middle of that circle. That's amazing for so many different reasons, you know, and um, this feminine quality, you know, it's, uh, it's associated with the primordial goddess, 
right? This dark mother sort of concept, right? From which everything emanated from. So I would say, essentially, you know, the cosmos is feminine, you know, from an occult perspective, that I find that most occultists, they see things this way, that the universe itself is deeply feminine, and her creations are, um, and her first creation, actually, is very, very masculine, but it's of her essence. So she created her masculine counterpart. So in some ways, this reminds me of the story of Sophia and the Demiurge. And with the material that I'm reading right now, it relates to Typhon, the mother, and then Set, her child. And so there's a lot to get into with all of that stuff. But the fact that you can just very clearly visually see, you know, the glyph of Venus encompassing and um, being laid out so that you can actually fit all of the Sephiroth along her lines, you know, to me is pretty incredible just in and of itself. So, so that's one thing that I wanted to mention. Go ahead. No, I mean, this is great. I mean, I love the, that last Sephiroth um, being in the center of that circle of the glyph, because it's just, it's like entering the void. It's uh, going mm -hmm. into the darkness and through the darkness, you find the light um, and going into the dark spaces of yourself. You find, you find the light, you, you end up, you can transmute the darkness into light when you are working in that energy. And so to me, it's just so perfect that it lines up like that. Um, and so I feel like we could talk about that for a long time because there's just a lot of symbolism there, but it's, yeah, this is beautiful. I love this connection. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And um, just as an example, in the Rider Waite version of the High Priestess, she's in between two pillars. And so she's in between two pillars. When you're looking at the Kabbalistic tree life, I've said this a million times, but there's three pillars. There is the masculine pillar, the feminine pillar. And then right in the middle, that's the transcendental pillar that is uh, basically alluding to um, this bridge to the other side you know, to the spirit realm, essentially. And she's right there. So woman really is a gateway. She's truly a gateway. She is the middle way. This is how we get into this place to begin with. You have mom to thank for all of that. And um, some of these uh, myths that I'm referring to, the Typhonian myth, the, um, the uh, myth of Sophia and the Demiurge and everything else, one of the ideas is that and this relates to some of the other things that we'll be talking about, but uh, that woman, the the cosmic woman, knew it, if you want to refer to her as that, or knew it, right? N-U, N-U-I-T, um, or knew. But um, she basically, the idea is that she had a virgin birth, and so she didn't need, you know, this counterpart, or it wasn't required for her to physically breed with somebody, that she had everything within her to actually create a child, you know, and oftentimes this child is looked at as being, you know, her complement um, in so many different ways. Very interesting. Yeah, it looks like a baby rattle. <laughs> I totally agree with that. Um, and so one other thing regarding the Venus glyph, which I'm sure we'll probably have other things to say about it uh, later on in the presentation, but if you move on to the next slide and you just take the Venus glyph in and of itself, and you add horns to it, you get the glyph for Mercury, which I think is really intriguing. And so to me, there's a direct correspondence or there's a direct relationship between Mercury and Venus. And I've actually read in some of my resources, and this really, I found just to be fascinating. Um, what was said was that Mercury is actually the consort of Venus and not Mars that perhaps Mars is the partner of Venus or the consort of Venus, um, more so on an exoteric level. But when you look at things from an esoteric perspective, Mercury makes a lot of sense. And so all you have to do is just look at the glyphs. You know, you just remove the horns and you have the glyph for Venus. Very, very interesting. And then also, too, with the Mercury glyph, you remove the cross down below and you're going to have the glyph for Taurus, which is ruled by Venus, right? And so we're in Taurus season right now. So um, the time of year we're in right now is deeply Venusian. You know, you look at springtime and all of the abundance, you know, that's around us with everything returning, you know, the, the, 
lilacs, right, that you just uh, brought in, flowers and stuff. The birds are chirping. Everyone's happy. I'm happy. <laughs> you know, the sun <laughs> is like really here after this long winter, you know. Um, and so clearly, you know, springtime, even just think about it, spring, right? You think of kind of like this fountain, right? Or you think of like uh, a sprout and it's springing forth, you know, from that seed. Um, in a way, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the glyph for Aries as well. There's this springing sort of action with Aries that kicks off spring. So anyway, um, Mercury is very much related to the phallus in so many different ways. I've gotten into this on my channel in multiple streams and videos now. And so there is a masculine, although Mercury is also very, very androgynous, you know, he understands the masculine and the feminine. And so he operates on a spectrum. Mercurial energy is able to go between polarities, you know, between the negative and the positive, the light and the dark, the masculine, the feminine. Um, but I think as a partner of Venus, I think there's something to be said about this. So, um, are men from Mars or are men from Mercury? I think there's a lot going on there. And so I felt like this was worth bringing up. And you know me, I love Mercury. So I, I, I see mercurial symbolism everywhere. Yeah, no, I love that point. I mean, you kind of brought started bringing that up a handful of months ago. And when you said that, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me because I can see the case for Mars, you know, as well. But um, yeah, something about these connections, though, symbolically, just how you're breaking down this glyph and how it all encompasses, you know, Venus, Taurus, mm -hmm. you know, and Mercury is like, what, you know, what are the odds of that? Or what, you know, what's really going on there? So I think that there is a deeper connection there. And I think you're hitting on something for sure. Right, totally. Well, so check this out. This is really interesting. Uh, Aries corresponds with Mars, right? The first sign of spring. Taurus corresponds with Venus, the second sign of spring. And then Gemini corresponds with Mercury, the third sign of spring. So isn't it interesting that Venus is right in the middle and right before Taurus season is Aries, which uh, relates to Mars. And then right after her time with Taurus, once that's all wrapped up, it's, uh, it's Gemini. And so it's more mercurial in nature. So in a way, symbolically, Venus is in the middle of spring but she is sandwiched between the two potential partners that I'm referencing here, between Mars and Mercury. So just something else to kind of think about. But um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to say regarding the Venus glyph. But let's get into the letter that basically I so associate most closely with Venus, which is the V. V symbolism is fascinating. I mean, you, you know, we've been together for years now, but I gave presentations in person talking about the V and what, you know, is encoded in the V, where you're going to see it astrologically, um, all of these different sorts of things. And so the V is deeply feminine and the V is very, very powerful. <laughs> so <laughs> more V's, right? Yep, yep. And so um, it's related also to Virgo. So whenever Virgo season comes around, I see lots of V symbolism. And the relationship, too, between, I would say, Venus and Virgo, I, I think there's more um, alignments than not. I think that there's a lot of crossover symbolism between Venus, Virgo, um, lunar symbolism, etc. So when it comes to correspondences, when it comes to symbolism... You know, I'm definitely more of a person who tends to see similarities over differences, you know, and I like to um, compare and contrast symbols, but I like to really see how symbolically different signs, different myths are related, etc. And so anyway, the V, when you're even looking at the alchemical glyphs, the triangular glyphs for um, the elements, the upside down triangle just in and of itself, is water. And then you add the line, and it's earth. So versus the upward triangle is fire, and then you add the line, and it's air. So fire and air, the upward triangles, are considered to be more masculine in nature. And then the downward-facing triangles, water and earth, are considered to be more feminine. And so here, you're actually encoding a downward triangle. 
And actually what it does too is it's drawing your eye downward. It's drawing your eye down to the earth. And um, like I said earlier, Mother Earth. There's something to be said about the earth being related to the sacred feminine. In a lot of ways, you know, I, I think so many things, because everything comes from a primordial feminine goddess, the great goddess, the uh, the queen of heaven, everything is a reflection of her, in my opinion, even masculine symbolism. And so that's why when you really dive deep into um, masculine archetypal symbolism or like the masculine cards in the tarot, you're just going to find a lot of feminine energy. That's really what you're going to um, kind of uh, unveil. And then when you look really deep into the sacred feminine, you're going to find a lot of masculine symbolism as well. It's almost like you can't have one without the other. You can't describe one without the other. It's two sides of the same coin in many different ways, right? And so it's like the whole idea that light comes from the dark, basically. And so, and you can't have dark without night. You can't have summer without winter, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on. But this is drawing your eye downwards. So in many ways, I would say that the downward triangle being the earth glyph makes so much sense because you're acknowledging the earth, right? And also the downward triangle, the V is a receptacle. It's a vessel, so it can hold something. So it's related to water because it kind of reminds me at least of like a chalice or a grail, a holy grail, right? It's meant to hold something. So it's also related to the womb and uh, the reproductive system of woman. You know, it looks like it's supposed to contain, you know, something. And then you're getting into also, right, the yoni or the vagina, which, which starts with V, okay? Um, the other interesting thing, too, which I've said, uh, you know, many times, is that when you look at Taurus, which is ruled by Venus, in the night sky, you're going to see a gigantic V in the sky. And that V is going to have two stars, one really large star, which is Aldebaran, Aldebaran, which is one of its eyes, and then the other star, Ain or Ain, which is also one of its eyes. And so to me, it's really, really interesting that there's a gigantic V in Taurus. Like that's the most prominent thing in the Taurus constellation is this huge, huge V, which makes up the head of the bull or of the cow, um, which reminds me actually that really, truly, when we think of Taurus, we should be thinking of the cow, not necessarily the bull. And that way back when, my understanding is that Taurus was more so of a feminine sign I mean, it just makes a lot of sense. It's ruled by Venus, right? But over the years, you know, we tend to look at it, or when it's depicted at least out in the wild, you know, we tend to see this very energetic, uh, angry looking bull, <laughs> you know, this muscular sort of bull. But really, it should be a reference to the mother cow, the sacred cow. And so V is interesting as well, because if you want to move on uh, to the next slide, that you just put two Vs next to each other, and you get W, right? And so this relates to so many things that are feminine as well. Um, the first thing it reminds me of, it starts looking like waves, right? It starts looking like watery waves, water, right? W for water. And so um, when you look at a lot of older depictions of water, like in Egyptian artwork and stuff, you're going to see these waves, these zigzag lines. I mean, water clearly is deeply feminine for so many different reasons we probably don't even have to unpack that because you know it's, it's pretty obvious that that's the case right when we're going to be born the water breaks right we're mostly made of water uh water relates to our emotions you know and all these other types of things but the w you know we get womb right we get woman so there's there's a lot we get witch and so there's lots of words that start with the w that are deeply, deeply feminine. And I would just say that the W really is just simply composed of two Vs, essentially. So even I know in some languages, um, you know, it's like Vich, you know, it's like uh, the, the W kind of sounds like a V anyway. And then you just flip the W, right? And then, which is the next slide. And then you're gonna get M, right? Mom, mother, moon, all of these different types of things, matter, matrix right mountain mountain totally it looks like twin peaks right yep yeah i think that's what you were saying uh the other day which is totally true and so whether the v is 
you know, upright or upside down, because then you also get the A. And A relates to Aleph, which is the um, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which means ox, which an ox is basically, it's a castrated bull. So it's a domesticated bull so that they're more easily, you know, tamed so that they can work the fields and things like that. So even the A relates back to the cow or the bull, right? And so whether it's a V, whether it's an A, whether there's two Vs and it's a W, or whether it's upside down like an M, there are so many interesting correspondences that allude to the sacred feminine with all of this stuff. So I felt like that was worth relaying and talking about. And yeah, someone in the chat right said three. Exactly. All you have to do is turn it to the side. And then uh, also it looks like a B as well, which you're going to talk about a bit later. I also see the E. Yep, exactly. For sure. And so you see all of these different correspondences, which I find to be really, really intriguing, um, which is all just made up from the V, right? And uh, also, too, the shape of the V being vaginal in nature. You know what I mean? And so it's just kind of like the correspondence is absolutely there. And we'll see, you know, more examples later on in the presentation that kind of, um, you know, alludes to a lot of this stuff even further. But yeah. Um, this is great. I love this weave here. It, it it just makes so much sense and it blends together so beautifully. I mean, you can't deny a lot of these things once you start breaking them down, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. For sure. I mean, you can Even deny them. them. Go ahead. But <laughs> <it's just> like, <laughs> whatever, you know, the, the evidence is pretty clear to me that um, these things are all connected for a reason and it goes, it's very deep. Yeah, nope, absolutely. So the other thing is that the V is Roman numeral five as well, right? So if you want to move on, there you go. So um, the five, the five, the five, oh my gosh. I've said this before on other streams, but I'm like inadvertently learning so much about the five right now. And it's really blowing my mind. Like on a daily basis, I'm like learning something new about the five that I did not know prior or it's really, um, you know, it's leveling up my understanding of what five represents. So Venus, from the perspective of Earth, over the course of eight years, creates this five-petaled flower, right? This five-pointed star. And so this is sometimes known as the Venus Rose or the Venus Pentagram. Sometimes it's called the Kiss of Venus. And so when you see a five-pointed star, the pentacle or pentagram, um, it is a Venusian reference. I don't see how it's not. And so whether you see it in a flag, you see it, you know, in artwork, you see uh, some goth chick wearing it as a necklace or as a tattoo or something, you know, it's a relation, it's a, um, it's related to Venus. You know, that's how I personally interpret it. So when you see like the Turkish flag or the, the symbol for Islam, you know, generally, if there's going to be a symbol on top of a mosque, it's going to be the crescent moon or it's going to be the crescent moon with a five pointed star, you know, inside of it. That five pointed star is this reference that we're looking at right here. You know, it's a reference to Venus. And so and I'll show you all of the ways and all of the reasons why this is the case. So this is one example of the transit of Venus from the perspective of Earth, creating this five pointed flower or petal. And then if you move on to the next slide, you'll see just another rendition of this. And I believe this is over the course of like many multiple years of what ultimately the line work looks like, right? It kind of looks like a, a spirograph or a spirograph, however it's called, you know, but it's a really, really interesting design. And then if you go to the next slide, you will see. I just want to say that this, this one here. It really, to me, looks very, very much like the birth portal um, to me. Um, oh, yeah. It, it's just incredible. Um, it is. Yeah. It, really, wow. it truly is. Yeah. No, that, that, that is on point for sure. Wow. That's it's it's gorgeous. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Here because the five and the, the mathematics of the five pointed star, it's deeply transcendental. So what I've been saying is that. The five is the number between the physical and the spiritual. So between the material domain 
and uh, the metaphysical domain. So it, it literally, it's this number that is a bridge between realms, you know, I would say. And so, um, so we'll get into that. But here's just another example of the five-pointed star and just kind of what that all looks like. And you can see too, I mean, it works this way, um, I believe with all stars, but how you can, you know, within the pentagon, right, you can embed another five-pointed star. And then within that pentagon, you could have put another five-pointed star. And so there is this uh, fractal nature with the pentagram that exists on a few different levels, which we have slides for. Um, but there's a reason why the pentacle has also been related to Earth. So if, if you move on to the next slide, we're going to see the ace of pentacles. And so it's not uncommon. In fact, it's tradition to have the pentacles in the tarot system literally have a five-pointed star on it. So pentacles, right? Penta, pentagon. And so the reason why is because of everything that I'm outlining, but it's because of the Venusian sort of aspect of things. And so even on the Rider Waite card, that is the Empress, she has a, um, she has a heart. It looks like it's a, a heart made out of stone or something. And then she has the v Venus glyph on that heart. And so she is like the terrestrial mother. So she's like mom, basically, here on Earth, who gives birth and, and raises children and is domestic and all of those beautiful, wonderful, completely necessary things, right? And so it relates back to this Mother Earth concept. And so when you're seeing a pentacle in the tarot system and there's a five-pointed star on it, this is a Venusian reference as it relates to Earth, right? And so in some decks, like the Crowley deck, it's not pentacles. Sometimes it's coins. Um, I recently saw um, our friend Rachel was over and she had a deck and it's it was uh, rings. But uh, in the Crowley deck, it's discs, right? And so there's an interesting relationship, but he still has the uh, the five pointed thing on on the discs, I believe. But uh, the discs, um, to me, when I hear disc now, it sounds very, very much related to like geocentric cosmologies. This idea that we live on some sort of disc, right? Some sort of disc in the middle of a giant torus field, basically. You know, the plane of inertia, right, within the torus field. Taurus field, you know, I, it's just like, it continues to be this novel sort of thing. I'm like, wow, still of all the words for toroidal energy, we refer to it as the Taurus field, you know? So this gets back to ideas relating, um, the cosmos to a great bull, this bull of heaven sort of idea. And that, um, you know, in India, they refer to the cow as the second mother to mankind sort of thing. Um, and so it relates to uh, this cosmic womb idea, which we're really going to get into in a few slides as well. How the bull or the cow relates to the cosmic womb, but also the terrestrial womb, the, the womb of woman. And how literally the reproductive system of women looks very, very cow-like and bull-like. Which we have some amazing slides for that, which I'm really excited to get into because... It's just crazy, the resemblance, in my opinion. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, you're going to see a simple pentagram, pentacle. And um, the mathematics behind this basic star, one of the things that trips me out is the fact that, you know, we've been drawing this since we were children. Do you remember drawing stars when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. I mean, when you, I remember the joy <laughs> of learning how to draw it. And then that was like the thing. You just drew it everywhere on notebooks and this and that. And I think that there's something instinctual in us that when we learn to do that, at least for me, that's how I was. Then I drew it everywhere. I would have I would have it all over my <laughs> pages and stuff. Now, that was probably boredom in school, number one. But number two, I think that there's something there that um, we all can sense and feel that is like deeply rooted within us because this is symbolizing, you know, the root of creation, you know, the root yeah. of the creation of all, um, in, in my opinion. Um, and so seeing this uh, shape and then learning how to draw it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of in, engraved in my mind um, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. No, exactly. 
and even just the um, the mechanics of of drawing it and how we can like it's it's memorized, right? And so um, there aren't many other stars, right, that kind of operate the same way. So, um, but the five pointed star, it just like lends itself to be drawn everywhere, right? And there's a status you know, a satisfactory sort of thing that comes with actually just drawing. In fact, I want to draw it right now. <laughs> Boom. That Do felt it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. um, the five pointed star I recently learned, which I just, wow, it, it's so cool. But the, the great beyond the other side, the underworld, you know, in ancient Egypt, it was referred to as the duat. Okay. The symbol for the duat was the five-pointed star. And so it didn't look exactly like this, but there's five points, and that's all it is. It's nothing crazy. You know, it's five points emanating from a center, you know. So of all the glyphs, of all the signs, of all the shapes, of all the numbers, you know, it's a five-pointed star. And so this is, again, a reference to this star, this shape, the number five, the properties of five, the sacred geometric aspects of five, they're completely transcendental and spiritual. And so when we're looking at this, we're looking at a shape that exists between these realms. It's a bridge, you know, between these realms and realities. And this gets into a lot of trippy information too about, you know, ancient gods relating to the number five. It's fascinating that, you know, one of the things I'm picking up right now is that in the Lovecraftian mythos, the old ones or ancient ones, they corresponded with the number five. And a lot of the things that they had built in their culture relate to the five and relate to the geometry of five. Um, this is intriguing, too, because when you break down, you know, the, the way certain plants, you know, grow and unfurl and spiral and stuff, it's encoding a lot of the geometry that you're going to find uh, in the five which I just have to say that one of the um, one of the Greek letters that corresponds with the ratio that relates to the five is phi, and so this is I believe where we get five from. So it's P H I phi five, all completely related. Um, obviously, we have five fingers, five main appendages, etc. So it's like it's a deeply you know it's a deeply um, resonant thing for us to understand because of how we're built, you know, and how we grow. And um, if you want to move on to the next slide, you'll see that there's this ratio that's encoded within the pentacle. And so I put dots at the end of this line that's highlighted. That ratio between the longer line and the shorter line is absolutely mind-blowing. And so I actually have if you want to full screen me, I have these calipers here, which basically encode the golden ratio. <laughs> You're muted, baby. How do I full screen you? Hold on. Um, it should be in the options just below the screen there. If it's too complicated, don't even worry about it. There, there we go. are. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you see these calipers here. So as I open these calipers and as I close these calipers, the distance between the points stays the same. The ratio stays the same. And so this is the golden ratio right here, right? And so our uh, appendages, our bone structure, so many things in the natural world relate on this ratio to again, unfurl and grow and spiral and whatever else. And so I've got a couple of other slides here that kind of illustrate, you know, what I'm talking about. But that ratio right there in the pentacle, deeply, deeply important, super significant, lots of things to get into with that. But uh, it's related to this golden mean or golden ratio uh, design, which you'll see in the next slide there. Right. So this is the golden spiral, or the uh, it's related to the Fibonacci sequence. And there's a million different things that we can get into with all this stuff. And I'm sure, actually, uh, a decent portion of you know your audience here, our audience, um, is aware of some of this stuff. 
But just really quickly, you notice that the square on the left, the large square, and then the square on the right, um, it's the same ratio that I just outlined in the pentacle. And so, and then the square on the upper right and the square in the lower right, it's the exact same ratio. So it's the same ratio all the way down. And so it's like this infinity spiral sort of concept or idea. And so the spiral, you know, is I would say it's it's also this bridge sort of idea because it is bridging the inner with the outer, right? And so it reminds me a lot of toroidal symbolism, to be honest, because the toroid, right, it projects energy and then it just gets returned back to the center. And so um, spiral symbolism, again, you're going to see it all over the place from, you know, our uh, DNA strands to the way certain flowers look and, you know, the way uh, their petals grow and all this other kind of stuff, that this spiral, this curve is really, truly a curve of life. And um, believe it or not, the number five is completely related to the uh, mathematics of what makes this, uh, this spiral possible. And so if you move on to the next slide, we're going to see a version of the Hierophant card. And when you're talking about the Hierophant, you're talking about a mediator between Earth and the gods or God, right? Depending on, you know, your religion and everything else. But basically, he's a high priest. And so a lot of older decks basically show a pope, a pope-like figure, or literally it's called the pope card. <laughs> and uh, the pope, he is known as the pontiff maximus. And so this means bridge builder. And so he is this uh, go-between between between these different realms and uh, between the people and what's happening in heaven and everything else. So the symbolism behind the spiral, behind the five, um, very much relates to the Hierophant card as well. And so if the spiral is this bridge between inner and outer, um, if the pentacle or the number five is this kind of transcendental number between the physical and metaphysical, the material and the spiritual, well, it would make sense that this is what this card is also about as well, right? But, you know, where did the Pope come from? Or where did the Hierophant or the, uh, the High Priest here come from? You know, where uh, his, you know, the energetic quality that he's related to comes from woman. It comes from the Divine Feminine, which is why you're going to see this figure down below. And this is symbolic of Isis, or what I would say, just in general, the Sacred Feminine. You know, so um, she's holding that crescent moon there. Right. As I was saying, there's a lot of overlapping symbolism between lunar symbolism and and Venus. And in fact, there are some astrologers out there who suggest that a lot of lunar symbolism used to be attributed to Venus way back when and that there were Venusian cults and that at some point, a lot of the myths and a lot of the symbols and glyphs and understandings behind Venus including the fact that she has her own cycles, um, a lot of those understandings were kind of transferred over to the moon, which I just think, if anything, it's just an interesting thing to kind of consider or chew on or whatnot. And so this whole card, the way it was designed, is suggesting that uh, this high priest is basically, um, his origins lie within the feminine. And so... One thread that I've been pulling at, and I've said this before, but when you're looking at emperors, when you're looking at hierophants, when you're looking at other uh, kings, right, like in the court card section of the tarot, when you see a masculine uh, figure throned, he is mirroring the queen. He is emulating the queen. And so to me, this is really, really intriguing, and it says a lot and so the throne is more so related to the sacred feminine. So the queen's throne, or sometimes uh, another related symbol is the bride's chair. The queen's throne or bride's chair is deeply, deeply feminine. And so I think that that is kind of what is being alluded to when you see the hierophant or the pope and he's seated, you know, and oftentimes too, he's seated between two pillars, 
right? Not unlike the high priestess as well. So he kind of is acting as a substitute middle way as well. Um, and so a middle way between you and the divine, I guess you can say. And so I've heard some discussions recently regarding, you know, what keys are associated with the Hierophant. Because it's not uncommon for the Hierophant to have these two cross keys down at his feet, right? And I think the keys symbolically represent a few things. And I think that it represents the gates to heaven and hell. There's this whole thread uh, suggesting that the real gates of heaven and hell exist at Taurus and Scorpio via the two royal stars of each system, uh, Aldebaran in Taurus and then Antares in Scorpio. That's one way of looking at it. And uh, sometimes they're referred to as the golden and silver gates because these keys are golden and silver. But one of the other keys, which I think is really interesting, and um, I, I think it, there's something to say about it, there's something to be said about it, is the fact that the real keys here are, you know, the keys behind sacred geometry, the keys behind communication, you know, that his understanding of these mathematics, his understanding of language, you know, that that is a key, that's a potential key here as well. And so um, you don't see the cross keys here, but that is, you know, that symbolism is related to this card, which we will see a, a Rider weight version of this card here. And so um, there's also like a Trinity sort of thing going on there too, with uh, Isis or Venus or Mary, you know, I could say that that's also a correspondence. And then also uh, the Hierophant being a father-like figure, you know, you can call a priest a father, and then within his chest, you have a uh, child, right? Um, yeah, exactly, right. So yeah, the, the papal keys or whatever they're called, well, 100%, they're, they're golden and silver. Hey, Slick, yeah, it's, it's great that he's here. He's, uh, he's awesome. And actually, he, uh, he was talking to Chance about some of these keys behind the Hierophant potentially being, you know, um, communication-based. And so there's a lot to be said about the throat of the Hierophant, as we kind of talked about too, you know, on other shows and everything else, and this idea of communication uh, with the Hierophant as well. So the number five, though, you see it in the larger uh, pentacle, and then you see it in a smaller one, and then you see a smaller one, and then even right behind him, right, you have the, uh, the five-petaled flower right behind his head. And so um, all very, very intriguing stuff. And I just feel like it's worth saying real quick as well that I did a three-hour Hierophant card presentation. And I'm talking about nail symbolism because the Hebrew letter that corresponds with this card is uh, Vav, which means nail. So the nail binds things together. It brings things together the same way ether or spirit brings things together. And so um, there's also nine nails above his head. And even to me, the V kind of looks a little bit like a nail, you know, that, that could be a little bit of a stretch, but it kind of looks a little bit like a nail. Um, and one of the fascinating things I learned right after I gave that presentation is that the, uh, an alternative name for Polaris is the nail star or the sky nail. And I've long said that the bridge to the other side exists at the North right? That Jacob's ladder or the stairway to heaven goes towards the Northern sky. And that hidden Sephiroth I was talking about earlier corresponds with the North, which, you know, many people have said. And so there is this idea that the bridge to the other side exists at the North and the bridge builder is the Pope himself or the Hierophant. And so, and these keys likely are keys that unlock, you know, the gates between these domains, the gate of the bridge, if you will. So that's exactly I think, what I was thinking, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking that of like, oh, my God. OK, so he's like holding the gate or he's holding the key to the gate to the other side is what comes through for me. And so that's good timing. And, and the other side is deeply, deeply feminine. Yes, that's the deal. And so what I've said for a long time, actually, um, is that it is a man's world, but it's a feminine universe. It's a feminine ah, cosmos. Yeah. I think that's the symbolism. You look at a circumpunct, which is the circle with the dot inside of it. That circle is the womb. It's the feminine. It's Nuit. Nuit. 
Um, and that dot in the middle would be had it, or it would be the masculine. It would be the point, right? And so it would be the phallus. So the circle, feminine, yoni, dot, phallus, had it. There's all sorts of other correspondences with it. So the way I look at it is, again, it is a masculine world, but it's a feminine universe. I think that's kind of how it breaks down symbolically. That's my understanding, at least. So again, woman being literally the gateway uh, from the other side. Very, very intriguing stuff. But uh, yeah, you can move on to the next slide. So speaking of gateways... <laughs> the ultimate gateway here. Here's the ultimate gateway. So I this love this is, illustration. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who did it. Uh, I, I tried to look for uh, credits. But um, anyway, um, if you look at this illustration, do you not see a bull's head right in the middle of the womb there? Oh, right? It's there, yeah. And so um, so this is the, the female reproductive system, you know, that silhouette right in the middle. I mean, I almost see like the bull's nose and uh, its eyes and the horns kind of shooting off from the side there. It's incredible. And um, this is something that's been encoded in other uh, hierophant cards, by the way. And so there is a relationship between um, the shape of the fallopian tubes and the cervix and the bowl. It's wild. So even we were talking about this last night. So go to the next slide. And it just occurred to me, I'm like, well, let's look up like real scans or let's look up real x-rays of this. And this is one of the first ones that came up, right? And man, to me, that really is like a dead ringer for a bull, a bull's head right there, right? Oh, yeah. And so again, Taurus corresponds with Venus, et cetera, et cetera, deeply feminine. And um, it's just amazing that the silhouette lines up like that so nicely. Um, and then we have one more example of that. In the next slide, it also, to me, looks a lot like a T, right? Or the Tau, the Tau cross. So just, you know, just to clarify that when I say T and I say Tau cross, I think that there's really, truly, in my opinion, symbolically, little difference between the T, the Tau cross, the Ankh, you know, things like that. So again, T for Taurus, Tau as in Taurus, T-A-U, right? The Greek letter T is Tau. And so um, to me, it looks like a T, very much related to all of the symbolism that we're kind of talking about here within Taurus season, right? And so um, to me, these things are obvious, and we have a few more slides that get into it. But the cross is related to the Hierophant, right? And so he holds that papal cross, right? And so it has three cross arms, right? It's like a super cross because it's not just one cross arm. It's three cross arms. And uh, one of the symbolic decodes I read about this cross recently was that it uh, represents a stair, a stairway, excuse me, uh, a ladder. And so that it's actually a ladder, not unlike Jacob's ladder, the ladder that goes to the northern sky. And there's really, really cool illustrations and paintings and stuff that um, essentially correspond Jacob's Ladder with going towards the northern sky, going towards the pole star, the north star, the nail star. And it's a nail star because the pole star is fixed and the heavens revolve around it, right? So it's like the hub of the wheel or it's like the pin within a pinwheel that everything revolves around, basically. Um, and then you can see too, within the pillars kind of looks like uh, more feminine reproductive symbolism, right up in the pillars there. So on the upper left and upper right. And uh, our buddy Kyle pointed this out in a, a live stream we did recently, and he's, he's totally spot on. And I've read that in other uh, resources and stuff like that, but there it is, you know, it makes perfect sense that it would relate to that. It relates to this idea of the hierophant, you know, being more feminine than not. And even there's some Hierophant cards where they look deeply, deeply effeminate. <laughs> and so that's just kind of one of the things. But there you could see the two cross keys down below relating to the things that we were just talking about. And um, and yeah, that'll do it for that. And very, very interesting, this T relationship, right, with the womb, 
go ahead and uh, skip to the next slide there. Isn't it interesting that the the tea like nature of this is so like prominent that literally some contraceptive tools literally are just T shaped because it just it fits within there snugly, right? So this is an IUD, which is a intrauterine device, right? So this is a contraceptive device, and so it looks like a T, as in tau or tau cross etc and so i'm not sure if you had much to say about this one we, we certainly had a colorful conversation about it last night but uh <laughs> chime in if you'd like yeah no i mean this this whole weave when we uh we literally kind of just like had epiphanies last night as we were making the slides because we came through all came across all this stuff and um yeah, I mean, you can't deny the IUD thing. And so I would say uh, many opinions aside <laughs> about birth control and all of that stuff. One of the things that Mario brought up last night was the whole weave of the sacrifice of the first son. Um, and now the IUD obviously being a birth control method. And what I learned mm -hmm. last night about this is that what the IUD actually does is while it's inside of the woman, it um, it your um, your womb will start to create more mucus um, because the IUD is in it, and what the mucus does and the, is then blocks the channels to the fallopian tube so that the eggs cannot come through. Um, and in my idea or my mind, what's basically happening is that this this IUD is constantly injuring your uterus and your uterus is going into its natural healing mode. And the natural healing mode is to uh, create the mucus um, to thicken the lining. Um, and so anyway, the whole idea of the sacrificing of the first son, and then this being like a sacrificial cross, it being the Tau cross, which was used as a sacrificial, um, you know, uh, shape um, and, uh, e you know, erected actual cross to be used. Um, anyway, all of these things just started bubbling up for us. Um, and so anyway, it's just pretty interesting to see that this is the deal. Um, and obviously they, they shaped it this way because the uterus is shaped this way. Um, but, you know, it's not a coincidence, though, <laughs> that everything is shaped in the way it is and shaped in the in the um, form of what looks like a bull's head. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting synchronicity or just think to ponder on so many different levels. And um, just to add on to what you were saying, this idea of sacrificing, you know, your first fruit, your firstborn. Um, it, it does relate to this bull sacrificial element via Moloch. And so I've made posts about this on my Instagram recently showing uh, just various illustrations of the Moloch um, sacrificial side of things. This gigantic bull that has seven uh, chambers sometimes within its body to accept these different sacrifices. And so um, there has been this sort of distortion uh, with cows you know like i said that there's this deeply feminine sort of thing going on and then after a while it seems like most of the cow symbolism is going to be this kind of ruthless bull um this aggressive energy coming from the bull and everything else so to me i just think it's really intriguing i'm like wow the iud is related to um you know this idea of preventing childbirth you know and then we have this bull god right that accepts these children as sacrifice and then one of the contraceptive devices here looks like a freaking T, which uh, relates to the Tau cross. So if you want to move on to the next slide, I just put in literally a T just to kind of illustrate this Tau cross sort of idea. And um, it's my understanding that literally, again, all T's relate back to the Tau and that they're all completely, you know, um, they're part of this same sort of construct or weave or thread of information. And so I also have a, a, an onk, you know, in the next slide, which um, generically, my understanding is that the onk was once referred to as the Tau cross, right? Yeah, there you go, Slick. Totally, totally. Yeah, That's so, um, yep. And so uh, to me, this there's just a lot of 
you know, stuff to digest here, a lot to uh, unpack, you know, and all of that. But we both felt like it was worth bringing up because it's a it's an intriguing weave, you know, for a few different reasons, right? What are the odds, you know, of all this yeah. stuff? No, definitely. I mean, it it, it couldn't be uh, ignored, <laughs> really, honestly. So, yeah. Right, right, totally. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, too, in the next slide is the fact that Venus corresponds or rules two different signs, as does Mercury. So that's another intriguing correspondence there, right, uh, regarding the consort of Venus being Mercury. And so Mercury rules Gemini and Virgo. So it's both an air sign and an earth sign that way. Venus has the exact same setup. So I, I, I think there's something to be said about this whole entire partnership. But Venus rules Taurus. We're in Taurus season, very earthy. And then Venus also rules Libra, and so which is an air sign, right? Well, it just recently occurred to me that there is a really fascinating relationship between these two signs that I've never considered before. I, I was aware of the information independently of each other. And then as we were talking about this presentation, I was like, oh, shit, this is something. So you have the bull, you have the cow, the cow's head as the glyph for Taurus. Obviously, Taurus is Latin for bull. And so um, as we've been talking about this whole entire time, well, one of the intriguing things, though, about the Libra glyph is that there's a few different interpretations. If you start looking into it, you're going to see that um, one of the common interpretations is that Libra, what it represents is what's called an ox yoke. And so if you move on to the next slide, you will see an example of an ox yoke. And so this is basically the harness that an ox will wear, which again, an ox is a castrated bull. Um, you will see that this ox yoke does look like the Venus or the uh, Libra glyph, excuse me. And so all you have to do is look at it upside down and you kind of see the glyph for Libra. And so that is one of the interpretations behind Libra is that it actually represents the device that the ox or bull wears so that it can pull a plow. And so plow symbolism, there's lots of sexual connotations with the plow. There's northern connotations with the plow being related to Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff even just to say about the ox being castrated and, and all this other stuff. But long story short, isn't it interesting that the two signs that Venus corresponds with, that it rules, is Taurus, the bull, and then Libra, which some people have said has hidden bull symbolism baked into it via this ox yoke. So just thought I would throw that out there as kind of my final thought, uh, wrapping up some of my uh, Venusian you know, conclusions here. But uh, anyways, that that's that's literally brand new to me over the last like day or so where I'm just like, whoa, OK, so Venus, bull, cow, gotcha. Like it's even stronger than I realized previously. Yeah. Wow. Yep. This is great, Bob. I mean, this is such a great uh, weave to follow. And the way you put all this stuff together, talk about grace. I just have to say, I mean, I know I tell you this all the time, but you have such a way of presenting this information and making it, uh, you know, just absorbable for people. So yeah, thank you for doing all this and continuing to weave all these things out. Yeah, no, of course you got it. Um, last thing I'll say about this ox yoke real quick is that the two pieces come apart. And so that's the whole entire idea. That's my understanding is that you put the upper piece on the back around the neck the neck of the ox, right? We're talking about neck symbolism the other day as it relates to Taurus season and communication and all this other stuff. And then you also have um, the lower portion that kind of clicks into it basically so that it is, you know, harnessed and can pull the plow. Um, the other thing I'll say uh, real quick regarding, and we can actually get off this slide if you want. We could just full screen us or whatever because okay. I could just round out some of my final thoughts regarding the five, how it relates to Venus and uh, stuff like that. Nice. There you are. <laughs> and so uh, what I was going to say is that the five is really fascinating. So uh, the thread of information that I'm following right now has to do with 
Um, the cults that acknowledged a primordial dark mother at the north, and she is very closely related to the five pointed star, if I haven't already said that. And so the fact that you saw, you know, these five pointed stars literally emanating from the womb of Isis is fascinating. But the other um, decoding element that I wanted to put on the table here is the fact that women have a relationship to five specifically through their menstrual cycle and that the uh, days of bleeding generally are five. And so this is this is like an ancient sort of correspondence that literally that this has been known for a very long time. I don't know if it's changed. I don't know how many people here would agree with that or not. But I read this recently and then I asked you about your cycle and I didn't prompt you with days or anything. And you just said five. And yeah. I'm like, whoa, that's intriguing. So it is five. So five is related also, you know, to to that cycle. And um, to me is just that's like really really deep powerful stuff that again just kind of corresponds with everything else that i'm saying five being this bridge between realms you know which is why it's so important here in so many different ways um you can also look at it like five is in the middle of the base 10 sequence so whether you start at zero or one and you go through 10 the fifth number is like the bridge between the spectrums between um the lowest number and the highest number in that base 10 sort of way looking at things. So the five to me is, uh, it is truly this bridge, you know, it bridges the gap between so many different things. And when you look at the mathematics behind the five and the sacred geometry stuff that relates to the five, it completely backs all of that stuff up, like in so many different ways, it'll kind of make your head spin. Um, but you know, we highlighted enough, I think for people here. Yeah, no, definitely. I loved when you asked that because I thought, oh, yeah, well, ever since the beginning of my cycle, it's been like that. And I know that it ranges. It's different for for different women. But typically, that is what um, I've heard other women talk about. And then uh, Kim in the chat just confirming that hers was five as well. Um, uh, yeah, I love I love that weave that you brought up because that seriously makes so much sense to me. I mean, all of this stuff is just making so much more sense as we go along and we continue to talk about it and everything else. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, God, of course. Yeah. And we do have a few more things to even talk about here that I know we that do. you will um, be able to. Oh, go ahead. Before yeah. we get there, should yeah. I share my poster and then we can get a comment thing oh. going, a little giveaway thing going? Yes, yes. Do that. <laughs> okay. One second. Entertain yeah. the people here. Okay. So, yeah, if you guys are wanting to get your hands on or take a chance to get your hands on one of Mario's prints, this Taurus print, um, make put a comment. Just make a comment on the YouTube uh, video right now. And if you just – you can say whatever. Say hello. You know, you don't have to give us uh, – there's no contest of uh, the best comment wins. We'll just um, – anyone who comments – um, and you want to print, um, yeah, comment and do that. And, um, even if you want to just make a comment and then write print next to it, that's fine too. And then we'll know we can include you into the drawing and we'll just take a, we'll do like a random, you know, yep. whatever they have all those random things online that you can just put all the names into. So go ahead and yeah, put a comment down below on the video and, uh, yeah, we'll do that over the next couple of days and we'll, we'll pick a, we'll pick a winner. And I'll say, because I've learned my lesson, U.S. residents only. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> so, we have learned our lesson a few times sent, the hard way on that one. Yeah, I've sent prints all over the world, and I'm, the shipping is completely bonkers. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so this is my Taurus print, if you want to full screen things. Yep. So is it, uh, is it in focus by chance, baby? Yeah, it looks focused. Yeah. So there, there's lots of Venusian symbolism in here. You'll see the pentacles, one uh, pointed up, one pointed downward. Um, you know, Venus is also known as the morning and evening star. That's one of the traditions behind it. And so I'm kind of alluding to that. Um, I tried to really embrace the sacred feminine aspect of Taurus. And so you see a nursing mother here. There's toroidal symbolism. There's all sorts of stuff going on. 
And so um, there's seven stars that relate to the Pleiades, which is within the Taurus constellation. And so I have all of these available, or I have these prints available on my Etsy. But uh, And then you see the cross keys down below. But uh, yeah, they all come signed. They all come with bookmarks. They all come with study packets, you know, things like that. And actually, I might as well just, you know, shout out my Gemini print too. But if you have a Gemini in your life and you like my artwork, you can get them one of these prints. They're all silk screened by hand. Uh, I designed every element of them. And the idea was that, you know, I wanted to design prints that basically can teach you astrology and uh, really encode a lot of interesting information. And so anyways, there's lots of stuff to say about my Gemini print, but uh, the Taurus print is what people will be winning. Yeah, and, and Binna is saying uh, she just bought the Gemini print and she will did. hopefully get here, uh, get there in time for her birthday on June 12th. We'll try our damnedest. Yeah, it has a ways to go, but I, I yeah. actually think that's pretty realistic. I think I think it's realistic. I think we yeah, can it's going to get up pretty soon. So yeah, so people are loving it as always. They love seeing your art, and I love that you're going to share it <laughs> as usual. So awesome, yes. awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. And so again, may, if you want to be entered into the drawing, make sure you put a comment down below on the YouTube um, video that you're watching right now, not in the chat, because uh, we won't be going through the chat to to pick people. But we'll we will go through the comment section on YouTube. So just another reminder of that one. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to this and then bring us back in okay so you know we are we're going to continue to weave on this one um because you know i had some uh just i have some thoughts that i wanted to also bring to the table so we um you know we included some other slides here and so up on the screen you see burkana okay and uh i saw somebody i think it was justness um right here you're just right here um but i'm pretty sure you mentioned it may have been you mentioning that now you think of burkana when seeing the weave that mario presented with the m and the w yeah. and the v because i did bring this up on on last thursday this last episode and you know it kind of just became like this major weave that now here we are you know giving this presentation too but it's all connected because i brought up burkana and i wanted to i just specifically talked about burkana on thursday but i cannot not think of burkana when i think about venus and i think about taurus and i think about birth and what burkana represents which you know has a lot to do with death and rebirth and um, just looking at this rune, it's so beautiful. And I have such a strong connection to Burkana. And I feel like it is, it, it just encompasses all the things that you were talking about too with the, with the, um, W M and the V. Um, and when you look at Burkana, you're, you're kind of looking at a woman who you're seeing her bosom and you're seeing her belly. Um, she is a pregnant woman, you know, she is birthing something, whether it's a child or it's a project, or it's an idea, or a thought, you know, whatever. Uh, she she is she is creating something. This is like a rune of creation and, and um, you know, divine birth and and what that all looks like. And so Burkana is also uh, related to the birch tree, which we talked about a bit, and and she's known as the Lady of the Woods. Um, and so when I think of Lady of the Woods too, I do, I think of like mother nature in general and just what, what mother nature is. And I think Burkana kind of like encapsulates that as well, because there's that abundance, there's the fertility, um, and everything else that kind of comes along with the birthing process of something. And so it's also just related to feminine healing energy. And so Burkana can sometimes either be invoked or worn on your person or carried around with you. If you are struggling with men, you know, you're having difficulties with menstruation or uh, maybe you are moving into menopause and you're, you're feeling these fluctuations and changes, you know, Burkana can actually really help bring balance to all of those things. Um, and 
it, it can be a very protective, it can bring a lot of protection too. Like there's a lot of protection that comes from Burkana because there's a lot of protection that comes from a woman, like a woman, I think of a mother, like a, a good mother protects her young. That is the whole thing in nature. You see a mom and, 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 and everybody knows, you know, if you see a baby uh, cub, there's there there's probably a mama around and then you know that that mama is extra heightened at that time and she's actually extra dangerous because she is going to do everything she can to protect her young um and so there's that element too that that comes from it um there's also the connection of just like the underworld the spirit world being able to travel into these places with burkana um and then kind of as we we're talking about you know just looking at the venus glyph and that in the center of that circle it's like you can enter like you're entering the void you're you're going into the darkness and you know uh, there's a lot of darkness that comes with birthing process and the darkness of the womb um and so anyway i just i definitely wanted to weave in burkana in a certain way um you know because of these energies it's not necessarily like corresponded to venus but it's definitely corresponds to the energies that surround Venus and, and what kind of Venus um, symbolizes, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I just want to say too, it's really interesting. Uh, the fact that it's appropriate actually that mother's day would be within Taurus season. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, because of the uh, Venusian connections and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was kind of curious when, uh, it came this year, I was like, Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, that actually lines up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. So next up we have, I wanted to talk a bit about, um, you know, the hearth, the home, the family, domestic arts, because to me, this, uh, this is very Venusian and this is how I, these are the ways that I connect with Venus. Um, and so, I just find there to be so much Venus energy when it comes to uh, taking care of the home and being a homemaker. And even if you're not a homemaker necessarily, quote unquote, just being in the home and, um, you know, being attentive to it and what the home represents. Again, a lot of the same kind of things with Burkana protection creation uh, there's warmth uh there is an element of closeness like you, you typically you know uh there's family or there's people that you're close with even if you live by yourself you might have elements of a uh, family photos uh you know memorabilia things like that these are the places where we feel safe where we call we we go home to heal we go home to be uh, comforted all of these things um and even if you have not uh if you've unfortunately not had the experience of having a comforting home on the physical level we can create these things in the astral for ourselves and um i think that that's just something to be noted and here up on the screen this is one of my favorite artists her name is Adrienne Rossi, and she has a company or a project called the Poison. It's it's called the Poison Apple Print Shop. That's the name of her business. But up here on the screen, you're looking at her depiction of what she calls the witch's cottage. I, I saw this image a um, handful of years ago, and I just fell in love with it. And it encompasses my idea of a healing home. And so I first came across it when I was really first getting started with the healing home. And I found this image and I actually reached out to her and said, would you mind if I posted this, just reposted this on my Instagram, because it really encompasses like what my project is and everything else. And she, of course she said yes. And so I wanted to share this because if you're interested in what this type of art is, is showcasing, you'll love her style. And so she's the poison apple print shop on Instagram. Oh um, yeah. Her stuff is excellent. She, she's, she's so gifted and it's some of my favorite kind of witchy, um, looking artwork out there. Her, her style is, uh, has been refined over the years and she just has it going on. Yeah. And her, 
her essence and her love for the for the craft just really comes through and she has a really strong knowledge of herbs and and poison plants so she incorporates a lot of them you know in her drawings and stuff um but yeah this to me just is like it's almost like a dream home <laughs> when i see this that it is a dream home of mine and um it's just it's it's so wonderful and so you I would feel- uh, you would live stream out of there <laughs> yeah, I would try at least. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe be at a point in my life where I didn't have to live stream anymore and I could just crone out. <laughs> we could we could uh, crone right, and right. wizard out um and uh just sink in, you know. But um yeah, no, it's it's just so it's such a lovely piece. Um and so, you know, it it just kind of it it goes along with the abundance of home and and the abundance that can be created in your home. And um, just like I showed the lilacs in the beginning, I talked about this on last Thursday a few weeks ago. But you know, working with nature and the magic of nature and bringing this stuff into the house, you know, to me that that's like a that's a Venusian quality to beautify your space because Venus is a lot, is a lot about beauty. You know, it's beautifying things. And a lot of uh, things that are going on as we were talking about during this time are beautifying our landscapes because the flowers are coming back. The trees are coming alive, the bees, the birds, all sorts of bugs are all around and there's all this beauty just buzzing, you know? And so it just is very, very, um, very fitting for the time. Wow, I mean Bracana, and then you literally just said like four or five words that start with B. <laughs> you said bees, the birds and the bees. They both start with B. Isn't that interesting, right? Yeah. And then you said buzzing and bugs and and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I, I like the fact too, by the way, just that she's cradled the um, the artwork, you know, um, with those herbs or plants or whatever they might be. Um, and so. To me, it's just it, it's speaking to this uh, unifying sort of aspect that is the home, as you were saying earlier, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I know for a fact the herb on the left is mugwort. I don't remember what the one on the right is. But if you do look up her, if you look up this piece, um, even on her website, she goes through um, that other, whatever that other herb is. I can't remember. Yeah. But That um, does look like mugwort. Yeah, it's definitely mugwort. And then goes going along with that witchiness, the crone sort of energy. Um, but you know, one of the things too, that I think about with Venus, um, I, I do typically think of domestic arts, you know, and that being domestic is an art form. And there is, there's so much love that can go into being domestic and it doesn't have to feel like a chore. It doesn't have to feel like you're uh, belittling yourself by doing domestic tasks, you know? And I think that when you flip it for yourself and you see the beauty in it and you can see the abundance and you can see the shifting of energies that can happen by um, being connected with domestic arts, um, you really then start to tap into more of these energies that we're speaking of the beauty that comes of it instead of looking at it like, Oh God, I have to clean or we have to do this and whatever. It's like, well, you don't have to do any of it, but it's, it's for your benefit to do it on multiple levels. Not only is it to clear your space, but it's like to create even like a a, a pattern for yourself to, to be aware of it and to want to do it. And then those things bleed over into other things in your life. At least that's been my experience. You know, once you kind of like prioritize how you keep your space you will start to see that you prioritize doing that with other things in your life, whatever that might be. And so next thing I wanted to say, okay, cool. Kim looked it up. So it says mugwort and elderberry. Beautiful. That makes so much sense that the other one would be, um, would be beauty or would be um, beauty would be um, elderberry. So one of the other things that always pops up for me uh, is the gardening and um, the abundance of a garden, the beauty of a garden. Um, this is a beautiful garden. It's not our garden, but it's an image that we found online. And to me, this kind of like it, it, it's kind of this this garden is basically kind of like in full effect. It's it's really blossomed and bloomed. And you're seeing you're just seeing the abundance that that comes from the hard work put in in the beginning of the season. 
then towards the end of the season and just seeing what what was created, what uh, what what came of the seeds that were laid down, um, p- perhaps maybe in Taurus season. Um, and so there's there's that element, too, of it. Um, and so the the devotion and the commitment that is required to garden has really s- just I've learned that slowly, but I feel like to me, that is one of my biggest weaves that I've already started feeling coming in this year. Like that's one of my bigger um, breakthroughs of um, just commitment in general to these projects. And I have to shout her out again because Beth Martins brought this to my attention and we talked about it in our chat on her channel from a couple weeks ago. But like when you commit yourself to these things, um, whether it be a relationship or, uh, you know, a garden or a project or, you know, what have you, whatever it is. Um, it's like committing yourself. It kind of, you're like locking it in, in some sort of way. And, and a garden requires commitment to a, the attention, you know, and, and, and just going out to water. Um, this is another thing that we talked to, um, Rachel and Jim about of like that connection. Um, when you go out to water your garden, it's like, you're you're connecting to the divine and rachel mentioned that her mom has said like when you're in your garden doing that you're connecting to god and there 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 is something there and and you're connecting to the goddess as well you're connecting to venus while you're doing these sorts of tasks and so you know the other venusian quality that comes from the garden to me is the nourishment that that comes from it. it you're 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 probably going to be supplying yourself or your family or others around you with food that will nourish them and um you know there was time and uh care that went into this stuff and and all of those sorts of things are felt in the food in the plants in the flowers that come from the garden when you have that devotion and that connection to it you know, and I can't not bring up electroculture because uh, it's obviously I, I'm very interested in electroculture. A lot of people are right now. A lot of people are seeing results, ourselves included. Um, and the whole connection with the copper and Venus and the divine feminine. I, I talked to Matt Rowski about this, but I really think like one of the things you're doing, not only are you harnessing the earth's natural free energy that's around, you're harnessing the energy of the divine feminine when you're, when you're working with electroculture, in my opinion. Um, and then that whole connection with Venus and copper, um, mm. that the most conductive metal, um, it's going to bring the most abundance and things. I mean, it, it, my mind had just been like swirling with all those thoughts um, in terms of just electroculture and then seeing, you know, how voluptuous, how voluminous, how, um, how, how like healthy the plants grow when you're working with the electroculture, you know, it, it just, it is what it is. It, it, it is the divine feminine energy, in my opinion. Right. Well, if you're talking about ether or spirit, you know, tapping into the ether, um, you're talking about the fifth element. There's that five again. Yeah. The four main elements and the fifth element, which would be spirit. And so I think that's interesting. And as I was just going on about uh, regarding the golden spiral and all that, you know, here you can see this nice, beautiful spiral kind of going up this uh, little, it looks like, it's like a trellis, right? Basically. Yeah, it's a trellis. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a cool looking trellis, um, and so with electroculture, I mean, what are people doing? They're wrapping copper, as you mentioned, related to Venus, around a stick or or an antenna or something, you know. So it just reminds me of this again spiral of life, the curves of life, you know, essentially. So that's really really interesting. Yeah, those are good points because it's all connected, you know, and yeah. the other th- thing, the other thing, too, and I can tell. So they have that trellis around one certain plant. And so mm-hmm. I'm wondering, too, if they're actually working with some sort of energetic coil, um, you know, experiment or something with that one plant inside. It ju- that's just what it looks like to me. But I could be wrong. It might be a plant that's right. behind it, too. It's hard to tell. But um mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the last thing I just wanted to say too about gardening, gardening is a it's a work of art. There's an it's an art. Just like I was talking about domestic arts and the hearth and the home, there's art in that. Um and I think a lot of times um 
I felt like this, you know, in my life at points and Mario, you actually helped me to realize that it's not a hundred percent true. But like, I always used to, when you think of somebody as an artist, you would think of a drawer, someone who draws, someone who paints, someone who's a sculptor, you know, whatever. But you, we all are artists in our own right. And there's different ways to make art and you can make art in a garden. You can make art in your kitchen oh, yeah. with, the, with the foods that you create. And I always had this kind of like different sort of view about it. And this was years ago, you know, uh, that you brought that to my attention of like, well, art doesn't just have to be like pen to paper drawing something, you know. And I think that we're programmed kind of just in society in general, you know, that uh, to be an artist, you must like, you know, you must paint or draw or something anyway. So just a little like reminder to people that you, you can make art in so many things and uh, the garden is definitely definitely one of them totally yeah no there's this compartmentalization that art has to be something that can be put in a museum or something yeah. you know what i mean and so but really it's like your life is art you know and so you're creating every day whether you know it or not or like it or not or you're good at it or not or <laughs> whatever and so you're either probably either taking steps forward or backward you know, perhaps you're, you've plateaued or something like that, but yeah, no, um, maintaining a relationship, there's artistry in, in that there's artistry in maintaining your home and your, how you choose to spend your time. I was just saying this the other day that there's an artistry to running a business as well, you know? And so you're totally right. We all are artists at the end of the day. Um, and so it's not just, related to like what you're saying, visual or graphic or whatnot. There, there's artists every day who never pick up a pen or, uh, you know, never, never create anything visually or write music or, or anything like that. So yeah, right. completely spot on there. There's an artistry of just being a mother, you know? And I think that this is where the grace of Venus really comes in is that she has an understanding of, um, she just has an understanding of reality and the way things work and how to gently do things and to, um, yeah, be graceful and to have, uh, there's like this finesse sort of thing that kind of comes with it of understanding when something is done, you know, when to let go of something, right? There's all of this discernment kind of going on of knowing, I mean, just look at any like legit artist. I, for some reason, cooking's coming to mind, but you know, there's so many little nuanced details that a really good cook understands, of being like, oh, no, nope, you let it, it was 10 seconds too long. <laughs> you should have pulled it out sooner. Or, oh, no, that's too brown. Or, no, nope, you, you don't have enough butter, or it's too much butter, or it's whatever. There's all of these little types of things. And so, to me, the gracefulness of Venus comes into play with this gentle sort of attitude of knowing when is when, pretty much, yeah. with everything. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. In like the, the, it's all in the details too. You know, there's so many little details that you can kind of connect with all this stuff. Um, and so, yeah, beautiful points. I love all that. Nice. And speaking of beautiful, I just wanted to, I wanted to include this, this drawing, painting, you know, whatever in here, this is a mucha, uh, and I just have to say, I am so smitten for Mucha and I really have always, uh, love the Art Nouveau style. And, um, when I was just going through searching for images, um, this came up and I couldn't not bring it in because there is a Venus, there's five petaled flowers, um, uh, five, probably a rose in there. Um, and just his style in general is just something that I really enjoy. And so this kind of just encompasses a little bit like the beauty of Venus to me, mm -hmm. um, the beauty of woman, uh, the beauty of like more of like the natural side of woman. Um, and yeah, just love it. So I just wanted to throw this in <laughs> as a little nod to the beauty uh, of Venus, that beauty element for sure. And just look at all the curves, look at all the organic lines, you know, um, look at how nature unfurls, right? Yeah. There's five petaled, you know, flowers in there, not unlike some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah, man, beautiful, beautiful stuff. I'm glad you included it. Very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very nice. One day we'll have a I'd love to have a mucha piece uh, because it's just oh, so, so stunning. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about Frigga and Freya. Now, to me, 
they um i i typically look at a lot of these sorts of things through um i i like seeing it through the norse perspective with the goddesses um and so friga and freya really encompass a lot of venus energy um and mario and i have talked about this many times you know some people um think that friga and freya are basically the same goddess um they are maybe like derived from one another um uh, you know i do feel as though there's sep there's a separation between the two just when you start to study their qualities and what they what they offer and kind of what they represent there's a lot of similarities but there are there are some distinctions that separate them a bit and I kind of just wanted to go through some of this stuff with you guys because I find it to be very interesting and I just, I have a connection to this stuff and I think it's worth talking about, you know? And so with Frigga, she is kind of known as, she is known as the all mother uh, and she is a fertility goddess. So here, what she's depicted doing, she, it's sometimes said that she um, is one who spins the clouds. Um, she's also known to be the spinner of the wool that is used to then weave the web of life. And so she is the creator of this prima materia that is used for the, the web of life, which to me just, you know, really speaks to Venus and that divine feminine energy, just we're, like we're talking about the, the creation of life. So thinking of her spinning, you know, the wool that creates the web of life to me is, is it's so beautiful. Um, and and um, one of the distinctions between her and Freya is that Frigga is known as the giver of life and only the giver of life. But Freya is the giver of life and death. And so I find that interesting. I think that there's interesting qualities here because when I think of Frigga, I think of like, as, as we're saying, the all mother. Um, and when I think of Freya, um, there's a, um, there's like a, there's a less refined version of Frigga, if that makes sense. And that's not in a negative way. It's more of like Frigga is the wife. She is Odin's wife. And Freya to me is like the unrefined version of Frigga in the fact that she's not a wife. And like I said, that's not an, it's not a negative thing. It's just that I, I think that that's one of their main distinctions as well. And that Frigga is like a role model for women um, because she's also a domestic goddess. She is a goddess of the domestic arts. She's a healer. She also has the ability though to foresee the future so can sometimes be classified as a seer or a vulva but the thing with frigga is that she is unable to speak these things or chooses not to speak them and when she tried she she tried to save her son balder you know uh she tried to intervene with that and in in you know lo and behold his fate was sealed because one of the beliefs that you know freya Aswin brings up in her book, Northern Mysteries and Magic, um, it's that the idea that you should not interfere with anyone else is weird. It's not to be interfered with. It's not your responsibility to interfere with it. It's your almost your responsibility to allow their weird to play out the way it should because it's going to anyway. And you interfering, it, it may kind of, it's almost like the back to the future thing where like uh, you don't want to, uh, don't try and change something that you see that's going to happen in the future because it's it just like, it, it puts a kink in the whole thing. And so I love that belief because I think a good lesson in life is to know, just like you were saying, babe, when is when, you know, I think that there's a, the Venusian quality of, of knowing that of like the mother quality, knowing when is when to step in, knowing when is when to not step in and when to allow someone to learn their own lesson because they have to. <laughs> right. Right. And um, knowing when is when, oftentimes a lot of times is going to take um your intuition kicking in your intuitive sense about the situation or about the thing is going to allow you to know when is when of like okay now i need to intervene no i don't whatever so there's this intuitive thing there's a lot of beautiful things you just mentioned there this is way more obviously your wheelhouse or whatever but just wanted to say you mentioned the prima materia 
which is the like primal material, basically, you know, uh, which is also known as the quintessence, which ah. means the fifth element, which means spirit ether. So Whoa. going back to the five, so quintessence as in like quintets, like a five person band or whatever. So there's a there's a five relationship with the prima materia, basically. And as I'm just looking at this illustration, too, I'm like, isn't it interesting that we just choose, you know, it's almost something that we take for granted. How is it that we just chose for the five pointed star to be the default star when we're drawing things, when we're drawing the night sky? You know, that it, it's almost like um, something that we don't even think about, really. But as I'm looking at this illustration, I'm like, oh, you know, that's kind of funny. We almost just uh it's just something that is like the default sort of thing but it has to do with all the things that we've already been talking about right and then this whole spinning idea too i just can't not think of the spin of the cosmos i can't not think of the cosmic axis or world axis which is related to this um feminine sort of energy um as well as a masculine energy but there's a, a deep feminine quality to the northern sky and to the world axis as well and the spin is one of the major sort of things um, relating to that. So again, g going back to the wheel, going back to this um, circular sort of nature, uh, this nature of cycles, by the way. Another thing I did not mention earlier related to all of this stuff um, is the fact that literally um, the word period to uh, refer to a woman's cycle comes from the fact that it's representing a period of time, meaning time between periods, meaning time mm -hmm. between cycles. So literally the woman's cycle was a measuring tool. You know, you knew what is it uh, 28 days between yeah. cycles, you know, and so all of the symbolism that comes with the 28 and everything else, like literally women are natural time keepers, you know, and so the period isn't a, uh, a reference to the period of blood, the dot of blood, which is what I just always assumed, you know, and you, you see freaking um, commercials for pads and stuff. And they're always going to highlight that, that red dot, you know, that's how, kind of how they show you the period in, in, um, in commercials and things like that. Right. Or in billboards or whatever, but the period is actually a reference to time. It's a reference to a period of time, you know, again, cycles and, and things like that. So, Anyways, just a few things that um, that uh, kind of got me thinking here with everything that you're saying. Yeah, very no, very powerful stuff. That it all lines up. It's really great. Um, I love the quintessence um, and the fifth element. Uh, and then I just, it, I can't not think of ether too, you know. And so she's weaving. She's said to be sometimes she's sometimes referred to as the weaver of the clouds. And so you know, it's like you're weaving that cloud. Uh, energy that kind of lies between the air and the water and the sky and everything else. So definitely, yeah. definitely connections there. And then, you know, uh, another detail about Frigga um, versus Freya is that so Frigga is um, she's kind of like the goddess uh, or she oversees sanctioned marriages, whereas Freya is known to oversee unsanctioned marriages. So kind of, mm. again, going along more with that, like that refining um, element of Frigga, the more official or the more like overarching goddess sort of energy. And it's not to me, it's not like one's above and below or anything, but it's just like they, these are the differences that make them stand out from one another, in my opinion, that can can uh, argue the case that they are actually separate. Um, and... Yeah, I just think that there's something to to definitely be said about that. And then um, she's known as like she's more of like from the warrior class, the Aesir. Um, and um, so Freya is from of the veneer. And so the veneer is linked more with magic and, and mm. uh, you know, the Sadar that's that's carried out in spellcraft. And she is a seer. So she's actually she's more of like a practicing a magician, you could say, um, but both of the women, both of them are natural witches. Like both of them have these abilities and weren't necessarily taught from anybody. Um, they, they were, they naturally have this. And I think every person naturally has these abilities, but I think some more than others. And I think women specifically, um, 
have these natural abilities within them to, uh, you know, have a strong sense of intuition. Men as well. Men do as well. But I think that it's like a mother's intuition. You know, how many times have you heard that, you know, and then your mom kind of gets these hits on something and then, you know, lo and behold, she knew exactly what you were doing when you said you were doing the other thing. <laughs> and so that is so, that's sort of kind of what's going on here, you know, in my opinion. And so moving on. Now, this is Freya. I, I really love this illustration of Freya because it shows her as sometimes she is depicted as a warrior, which you see you see her here. She has her spear. She has a sword. She has a knife. Um, she is fully equipped. You know, uh, she she's usually referred to as the great goddess. Um, she's the giver of life and death, as I said. Um, she is also a goddess of love and fertility and sex and beauty, protection, war, you know? And so all of these kind of elements are encompassed within Freya and her energy. And then most people know her, uh, her totem animal is are the cat is a cat and lots of people know that she uh, cats you know uh, a cat drawn carriage <laughs> as i like to say you know as she her cats are there for her and i feel like you know i just have to say as a cat lady this is one of the reasons why i do feel as though i identify with freya um even a little bit more than uh, than friga um I see both of those elements inside of me and, and all women have both of these elements inside of them. As we talked about, uh, you know, privately Mario and I were talking about how like these goddesses and all goddesses are encompassed with, you know, all women have these encompassed within them. And you can, you can bring these out in yourself by invoking these goddesses in certain ways or, or, um, you know, uh, using some of their qualities and, and, and implanting them into your life and, and, and these sorts of things, you know? And so she, as I was talking about, she has to me more of like a mistress energy versus a wife energy. And I think that that's one of the things. And she's often known as like one of the most beautiful of Norse goddesses. Like, so she is very, uh, you know, she can be very compelling to a man or um, just she has that that deep beauty that can maybe stop someone in their tracks. That's kind of how she is depicted a lot of times. Um, she also too, you see this illustration, she's up in the clouds, you know? And so there's another crossover with, uh, with those two women. Um, and, uh, to me, I'm looking at this drawing and it almost looks like there's like a dragon or something like a dragon head behind her spear, yeah. um, that is yeah attached to her, <clears throat> excuse me, her chariot. And then she also has her shield, you know, so she's like ready, she's ready for battle. Um, but there's a softness to her as well, um, that, that comes through. Um, and so, it, yeah, it yeah. looks like she's uh, alluding to, or suggesting the uh, the power of her breast there. Yes. As well. Yep. I noticed that too, and I, that may even be kind of more of that like motherly fertility uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing going on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Exactly. So that that there's my weave with uh, with Frigga and Freya, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that because I sure do, and I think that there's a lot to be said with it. Um, and so next on the docket is Mugwort. And so Mugwort is also associated with both uh, Frigga and Freya, um, uh, sometimes more so Frigga. And I think that that goes along with like the dignified woman sort of thing, because Mugwort oftentimes is known as is, is called Cronewort. So you're having, you know, that just that extra level of wisdom mm. that comes from those extra years lived. I mean, literally, that that is more of what I think is going on um, with that connection. And, uh, you know, Mugwort, um, a lot of times, and I find it to be the correspondences with Mugwort are Moon and Venus. And I think that Moon and Mugwort are talked about a lot more um, than the Venus aspect. But I, I leave room for both uh, correspondences. And so I'm kind of taking the route of uh, looking at Mugwort as a, a Venusian herb this evening as we're talking about it. And so it's often referred to as a witch's herb. That's like one of the things that it's... Uh, 
It's referred to as just because of its ability to induce lucidity and deepen meditation and help one connect to their guides. Um, it's a seer's herb, you know, and we we're just talking about Freya and Frigga having that um, the capacity to be able to foresee the future or what have you uh, have the ability to um, you use scrying to their benefit, you know, and that's another thing too, that mugwort is often used for um, is it's either drunk before a session of scrying and, and in Norse tradition um, with mugwort um, drinking mugwort infusion that has honey in it before a, um, a scrying session was something that uh, I've read that uh, is a Norse tradition. And I'm not, you know, it might not exclusively be that, but there is some sort of connection there um, with the um, Norse people doing that. Um, and so, you know, I've talked about mugwort so much, but one of my favorite things about it is its ability to allow you to get into slip into these states of lucidity where, you know, the lines blur a little bit. Um, your, your sleepy time express, you know, is right around the corner and you know, everybody knows that feeling when you're right in between that moment, you know, where you're about to fall asleep, you're still sort of awake you know, mugwort takes you in mugwort can bring you to that feeling, you know, without going to sleep. Um, and so that's one of one of the best things about it. Um, the other connection that I see with um, with Venus and all we're talking about here in this section is the element of protection that it brings. Um, and it's that's something that I'm always attentive to as well. When you're working in these sorts of realms is the protection that you should be aware of having while you're doing that. And so one of the beautiful things about mugwort that I've talked about so much is that not only does it take you to these astral, more astral streams of consciousness, but it protects you while you're there. And that's really in, that 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 is very important. And a crone would know that, you know, a crone would know that you should have protection while you're doing these workings. Um, and I think that's another reason why it's attached to Frigga and Freya, because they Freya especially was practicing you know she was more of like a practicing ma magician practicing witch whatever you would want to want to say it's also known as a traveler's herb you know there's a connection with saint john the baptist that he wore a girdle of mugwort on his chest uh while he traveled um you know because it was a protective it was like an element of protection for him um and also oftentimes you know you can give a sprig of mugwort to someone to slip into their shoe if they're going on a long journey and that can actually help to ensure a, a safe return um and protection along their travels you know there's all these little folklore folk tales that are associated with all herbs but mugwort specifically just has this very beautiful um connection with travel uh whether that be mm. physical emotional, spiritual, what have you, there's a trap, there's like some sort of traveling element uh, going on with this. Exactly. Also, oh, go ahead. If you have something to say. Uh, just real quick regarding the traveling thing. Uh, just want to mention, you said spiritual travel, right? Traveling to mm -hmm. the other side, astral travel, things like that. And how um, going to that place is a feminine experience, basically, is my understanding. You know, and so you mentioned the lucid dreaming thing and all of that, uh, which I love that whole weave as well of just with all of that information. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I picked up when we were in France is the fact that Nui, N-U-I-T, I believe, uh, is night, right? This is a reference to the sky goddess, Nuit, right? Bona Nui is, is good evening or good night. And so uh, Nui and night and the sacred feminine, they're all completely related, you know? And so when we experience dream time, that is, uh, that's a feminine experience basically in so many different ways because it's mysterious. Right. And so, because it happens when you, when it is predominantly nighttime is, you know, probably when you're going to be dreaming because you're asleep. Right. So anything about nighttime suggests going inward. Right. And so going going deep within your own psyche and, and all that kind of stuff. So just want to add some of those elements there and how uh, all of these things just relate to the feminine. 
Yeah, no, that's freaking great. I love the night and and just like the uh, yeah, the mystery that is woman, the darkness of the womb, you know, going mm-hmm. inward. Yes, these are all very feminine um, practices and and feminine 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 themed things that really it all kind of connects, you know, and um, there's kind of like a darkness with Mugwort as well. Like she encourages you to go into the darkness, you know, she, Mm -hmm. she wants you to, and then there's no mistake or no coincidence that she's a dream time herb, you know? Um, And, and typically what happens um, my own personal experience and people who have, um, you know, purchased Mugwort tincture from me or oil or what have you and have reached out, Typically, we'll talk about how mugwort, when they start taking it, will a lot of times bring up things that maybe they thought were already resolved Mm. that will bring it up to the surface in the dream time, in dream time. And I think that, you know, mugwort kind of just like is a little knock on the door here. Like she will bring maybe something that, well, you, you, you did a lot of work on this, but there might be this one other thing that's relevant to you healing right now with for you know for reasons of what you're going through in your actual physical waking life you know and i feel like that there's there's some sort of element of of that with mugwort that you know i find to be um just really beautiful too yeah yeah absolutely and so this is just a great uh, illustration. It floats around the internet quite a bit, but it, it really encapsulates just a woman in her home, in her space, working her magic. You know, she is, she's scrying. She's looking into the bowl of water, which, you know, scrying can be done in a, in a few ways. You know, you can use a mirror, you can use a black mirror, you can use a flame, you can use water. You know, um, there's scrying like... Um, have it's i'm not going to get off off a camera frame but i do have another um actually and it has a five-pointed star in the center of it we actually bought it at invoke but it's a disc it's a scrying disc you know um and so you can use lots of things to scry with you know you could scry into a flower you know (laughs) you know it's like there is the possibilities are endless but this image just really portrays this in a big way and I, i i really do like it um, and so, uh, you know, going along with the, um, the Norse connection, uh, it's said that mugwort is actually a, the, a plant of the plant of Midgard, which is, which is earth. And, um, you know, Freya Norling is a woman on YouTube that some people may know who she is, but if you're into learning about like Norse, um, traditions specifically with witchcraft um, she's a wonderful source but she has a quote and she says one starts and ends with mugwort as one starts and ends with midgard um Mm. and isn't that cool i i just i i really love that quote and it makes so much sense to me that yeah we if you're coming through the realm you know if you've been brought into the physical here well yeah here is your beginning and you 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 can start with mugwort you know it's uh really interesting she she's a beginner and she's an ender or something it's really cool so i i just i really love um i love that that's it that's mother that's the great mother Be- beginner yep. and ender you know beginnings yeah. and endings cycles you know, all of that. I know I mentioned it the other day, but uh, I do have one tarot deck where literally the death card is a pregnant woman. And uh-huh. so to me, it just kind of encapsulates all a lot of these things. So um, giver and receiver, you know, giving life, taking life sort of thing. So all of these things are really deeply encoded into uh, some of the stuff we were talking about tonight. Yeah, no, this is awesome. And this has been super fun. And um, one last thing with Mugwort, and I always want to shout her out because she's one of the herbalists that I really love. Um, And uh, her name is Robin Rose Bennett. And she has a quote, or it's not a, it's not a quote, I'm prefacing what I've heard her say. But she suggests that Mugwort, it's a way to open and connect with one's third eye, and the inner wisdom that's contained there. And she also talks about how mugwort can actually help you tap into the dreams that you hold within your heart, like the dreams you have for yourself um, that you want to accomplish or that the dream, you know, the grandiose things that we have for ourselves 
that we wish one day or, or work to or strive to achieve, you know, mugwort really helps you to um, hone in on that and um, take stock of what the very, very important things that are that re reside in your heart that you want to see for yourself, the, your loved ones, your the world around you. Um, and it can kind of help you to tap into that and like focus, bring focus to that. Um, and that's just something that I wanted to uh, talk about with mugwort um, in general, because it's not just about, um, you know, uh, dreaming and lucid dreaming and tripping out and all this stuff. You know, there's so many other things that are tied to this herb and that, it, you know, that are you that it's useful for. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but the lastly, just that um, it brings such a wonderful balance to a woman's menstrual cycle. Um, mm -hmm even also like during menopause and, and all of this, these whole, all of these cycles, you know, it, it, that is another really deeply um, beautiful Venusian connection with this plant is that it, it can help balance a woman's cycle, no matter what point she's on of the cycle, um, maiden, mother crone, you know, whatever, uh, premenstrual, postmenstrual, uh, premenopausal, in menopause, postmenopause, just all in all, a wonderful ally for that. It can really help relieve cramps too uh, when you are menstruating and really help balance out any kind of like um, spikes of emotion that you might um, encounter during PMS, you know. So, just a little tidbit for women out there who are looking for another ally uh, in that respect. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. And I think that's, uh, I think that, yep, that concludes it. So that's my last slide. Um, so yeah, before we kind of uh, go through the final slides. Uh, yeah. Thanks again, Bub, for being on. And this was amazing. I think together blending these two, it's so cool. And we talk about this just like, the way that our information, um, it's like it differs, but it complements and it like comes together in this way. And we've that's just a theme that we've noticed throughout our relationship of like the way we we see things, we view things um, very similarly in a lot of times, but very differently in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. And so it's one of the things we've talked about many times of just how like our opposites um, just really are so complementary. Um, and when you start to work with opposites and, and realize actually how complementary opposites are, it, it's kind of mind blowing, actually. And so I feel like this, this, this presentation even kind of like it, it, it um, it, uh, it uh, is an example of that for sure. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's a beautiful thing. So uh, thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun putting it together with you and thinking about some of the things we we're going to talk about. And it's just, uh, it's awesome because every time we do something like this too, we're leveling up our understanding of it by virtue of the fact that we're even talking about it and then hearing people's comments about it and things like that. And then it encourages us to look into certain things. And so it's a win, 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 you know, all the way around. I agree. And uh, yeah, so before we head out um, again, as in the beginning, uh, just let people know uh, what you're excited about or if you want to, um, yeah, just uh, plug anything or what have you go for it before we go through the final slides. Yeah, totally. So um, the main thing, which we have a slide for tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a live stream with Juan from the Juan on Juan podcast. And we're going to be talking about the tunnels of set which is a really, really interesting thread of information. I kind of lightly alluded to some of the things here today, uh, but I've been prepping for this conversation for a little while. I read a couple of books to help me kind of get in that mode. And the information is totally wild, right up my alley. I feel like I've leveled up as like a symbologist getting ready for all of this information. And so definitely look out for that. It's going to be streamed on his channel, and then it's also going to be streamed on my channel. So I think the best thing really is if people kind of like, you know, my um, sort of decoding skills, I guess you can say, then definitely give me a follow on uh, on YouTube here. And then I'll be curious to see who ends up uh, winning this print as well. So just the final reminder to leave a comment. And within the next, I, I think you said two days, so maybe we'll give it 48 hours. You know, yeah. 48 hours from now, we'll find a comment. We'll just randomly choose a comment. There's different sites to uh, generate that choice. So it's not going to be based on, you know, our choosing necessarily. And then uh, we'll just be in touch. So um, an early congratulations to whoever wins. 
Yes, the abundance of spring is here. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, just want to throw up Dave's comment here. Still processing that Taurus constellation has a star named Ein and can't help but think of Ein so far. I'm mm -hmm. not sure what that is, but you will probably do. You probably yep. know. And the three vessels of nothingness from which the Sephiroth emanate. Yeah, exactly. okay. Yeah, he's got it. Um, so that's actually, that's, that's cool that you noticed that and you're totally spot on. And that's actually, I don't know if I'm going to be getting into that dynamic specifically tomorrow, but that is completely related to this tunnels of set concept that Juan and I are going to be getting into. And so, uh, I have some things to send to Moonlander here <laughs> related to that because yeah, he's, he's spot on. He, he picked up on one of the, uh, correspondences there. It, it is trippy. It is very, very interesting. So we'll have to uh, have a chat about that or something at some point. Yeah, nice. And I uh, uh, just want to say, Sunseed here in the chat, Rachel, um, speaking of Divine Feminine and all these things, me, Rachel, and Beth Martins are going to be sitting down here um, pretty soon to record a chat on the, the, the Dark Feminine. Um, we're going to do part two of the chat that we started back in November. Um, and so anyway, that'll be coming out um, soon enough. That'll be on Rachel's channel. But I'm very lo much looking forward to that. And nice. it, it's, it, it's very relevant to this conversation as well. All right, so I'm going to put these slides back up here and go through the last slide. So, as always, thank you to all the patrons. Um, I have to say I had uh, we had a patron that we weren't able to add to the, to the list because we had already made the slide. But um, Logan Cook, thank you so much for signing up. He just signed up today as a patron. So thank you, Logan. Um, not up on the list, but uh, you will be uh, for our uh, last Thursday episode for sure. But uh, yeah, so just saying thank you to Chance and Binna, Inland Sea, Liam, Amy, Miri and Hank, Jenny G, Erica, Moonlander, Mary, and Catherine. Thank you so, so, so much. You are helping Mario and I in a big way, bigger than you know, on so many levels. And uh, it your support means so much. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash the healing home or patreon.com slash symbolic studies. If you'd like to support either Mario and I, or both of us, that'd be great. We love it. We are uh, just like, just so over the moon about being able to uh, do all this work. So thank you guys. And I just said it. So patreon.com slash the healing home. You can go there. Next week's show, we have our good friend, Christy, from the shop Invoke. Now, I'm so excited to talk to Christy. Uh, me, Christy, and Mario have known each other for a handful of years. She's been such a catalyst for Mario and myself. She's so supportive. She has so much wisdom to share. And when I asked her to be on and she said yes, I was, oh, I was so excited. So I'm jazzed uh, because I want Christy to have the floor and to be able to share her story. Uh, we're probably going to talk about runes for sure. That's one of the things that her and I have actually connected over, you know, over the years. Um, so that's really cool. And we're just going to flow and see where it goes because I just know that she has so much to share. Uh, she's such a wonderful person. And as I said, you know, both of us just uh, she is so near and dear to both of us. So uh, that'll yeah. be next week, uh, May 23rd, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Super cool. Looking forward to that one for a few reasons. But she has legitimately altered and changed the course of my research for like ever, you know, just with what she's exposed me to and let me borrow and what I've purchased from her directly and everything else. Like, I just can't say enough good things about her and how supportive she is. And um, she is absolutely no slouch when it comes to uh, esoteric information and insights and all that kind of stuff as well. So um, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a great one. I, I'm so stoked that she was down. So that'll be next week here on The Healing Home. Um, and then this month's uh, full moon offering uh, currently available is my CBD cannabis root and white willow bark salve. This is a beauty right here. One of my uh, tried and true remedies I've been making for a long time. It's helped a lot of people. It's helped 
helps me. It helps us, um, helps my family members. I've got, you know, my grandma's apartment complex uh, barking up my tree <laughs> for <laughs> a lot of the people she lives near. Uh, really love this salve too. Um, and so anyway, this is a good one. So if you're interested in placing an order of that or anything else that you see up on the screen here, you can uh, get a hold of me. Um, and yeah, you can also contact me about custom bulk orders if you're wanting to get like a large amount of something, let's say the CBD cannabis root salve, maybe you want one big jar of it. I do do those sorts of things. And I have, I have a great one to do that with would be the antifungal and wound healing salve as well. But I can make larger orders of things like that, but just reach out to me and ask. And uh, yeah, I can let you know if I can do that. Soap would be another thing because soap is made in, in small batches, but like it's made in a in a in a batch in in and of itself so it's like i could do if you wanted a whole batch of soap we would work something out and uh, we can do something like that too so michelle's healing home at gmail.com michelle's healing home.com and uh you can call and text me 503-568-1569 and just a little heads up for anybody who might get confused i don't have an online store I do all direct sales. So if you do want to order anything, you uh, will need to either email me, uh, contact me through the website, or um, send me a, a, a text um, in order to place an order. So for the foreseeable, for right now, that's what we like to do. It works out really well. So we'll, uh, we're going to keep up with that. As always, uh, last Thursday, every Thursday around here with me and Mario. So, uh, it, yeah, join us this week for another episode and see what we uh, both uh, bring to the table. We always are uh, throughout the week reminding each other to come up with a topic <laughs> for last Thursday. Uh, Mario is really good with reminding me as well, which I appreciate because sometimes you just get busy and then you think, oh, yes, last Thursday. OK, we have to think of a topic. So, um, yeah, as always here on The Healing Home, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for last Thursday. Thursday. And then this is a thumbnail just for the Tunnels of Set uh, show we're going to do tomorrow. And like I said, it's going to be streamed on my channel and Juan's channel. So um, you can go to either of our channels and you will see it at 4.30 p.m. Pacific. And so it's going to be interesting. I'm really looking forward to it for a few reasons. And Juan is an excellent researcher and uh he really goes after it when he does a show you know he likes to dive deep and so my understanding is there it really isn't that much material related to this concept online but um yeah it, it'll be it'll be interesting at least so check yeah that out. I am so I'm very excited to to see this this presentation just because of all the research you've been doing and what you've been telling me you've been learning. So yeah, yeah. this is going to be great and Juan is a great host and you guys get along really well. And so it's going to be a really cool show. So totally, totally. very excited for you to be doing that. And uh with all of that said, that I think will do it for this evening unless you have any closing thoughts. Um yeah. No, I don't think so. I think you did a great job. Yeah. I had fun. I'll see you in like 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. And uh, thanks again, bub. And uh, thank you to everybody out there. Thanks to the chat. Thank you for everybody who's watching this or listening to it afterwards. Other thing Mario and I are working on is getting all my episodes up on Spotify. So soon enough, you'll be able to listen to all of these episodes. If you don't feel like watching, if you're not a YouTube person, and we're going to also work on getting them on other platforms podcast platforms in the near future so as always thank you everybody for tuning in thank you for your support it means the world to me and us thank you so much take care enjoy the rest of your week and uh we'll see you again soon bye-bye see ya